Imagine the hive of activity which is in Al-Mansur's court in 750 AD. He is surrounded by incredible political intrigue, and among his hired scribes is the Zoroastrian convert to Islam of Persian descent. His name is Ibn al-Makafa. He can read the old Persian. He's already a well-known writer and intellectual. He worked for the Umayyad, so he had to be very deaf to be able to switch sides. When he begins translating Kariyak or Damanak into Arabic, but again, the title changes for linguistic and cultural reasons. Ibn Makafa's manuscript is called Khalila Andimna, or Khalila Wadimna in Arabic. It is important to note that each stage of its migration, the collection of tales, is remixed according to local culture and political systems. For example, Borzoi changes the title and some of the Sanskrit stories, and Ibn Makafa does the same, changing the Pavlavi title while also adding and changing stories. This is the remix process of cultural exchange. The animals in the stories change too, because, for example, there are no Indian crocodiles in Iraq, so they become tortoises. Let's show you the name changes here. That's the original top is the uh, Sanskrit names, Karataka and Damanaka. Then you can see it becomes Kadirak and Damanak, and then Kalila Wadimna. But uh, this, get, this is sort of a key to the confusion, I find, of the book. Once you realize, how can the Panchatantra, how can the, how, what's that got to do with this? But it does, because it actually, the stories are very much the same most of, them, most of the way. So, there are four notable points I'd like to make about Ibn Makafa's translation of 750 AD. This is the oldest manuscript template that we have in existence. All earlier, my favorite word, posterior manuscripts are lost. There is no Pavlavi manuscript. There are no Sanskrit manuscripts that are older than Ibn Makafa's. So he did save it. This is a very disputed area. I'm not going to go too deeply here because you have to be careful what you say because lots of people think it's their book. I won't do any further than that. Maybe later. Um, the second point is that Ibn Makafa's rendering of Khalil and Nimna is considered one of the first prose classics of Arabic. It is noted for its brevity, clarity, beauty, and its elegance of style. In English literary perspective, Ibn Makafa's work of Khalil and Dimna, roughly 680 years before Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, it is a work which is contemporaneous with Beowulf. Yet today, because of the continuity of classical Arabic, the book is used as a teaching tool for students of Arabic the world over. Ibn al Makafa's Khalil and Dimna is the touchstone of Arabic style. Ibn al makafas 750 AD Arabic version, by now two languages removed from its pre-Islamic Sanskrit original, emerges as the pivotal surviving text that enriches world literature. You can follow our story's progress as they travel. Oh, I got to put this up. Yeah, this is this from from the uh, the turquoise dot. You can see the enormous influence of this book is it spreads across everywhere. It, it goes back to Persia, it goes into Spanish uh, because the Arabs were in Spain, it goes Hebrew, Greek, Latin, and we're now we're gonna get down to the bottom right, which is the uh, moral philosophy of Donny, and it's called the moral philosophy of Donny because it's translated from the Italian by Donny. He wasn't a philosopher, he was just a translator. So, as you see, you can follow this, the progress of these animal stories as they travel downwards from the turquoise dot there. And Khalil and Dimna now goes everywhere, changing as it adapts, but somehow retaining its core intact, including almost always some of the original stories from the Buddha's Jataka tales. There's a tragic footnote to the life of Ibn Makafa, al-Makafa. Shortly after he completed Khalil and Dimna, 
a book about animals and survival in court life, he was murdered by the order of Caliph al-Mansar, who suspected him of being a little bit too clever, an insincere Iranian convert to Islam, who might be involved in political treason. Well, he didn't question it any further. Ibn Makafa was seen going into a government house in Basra and never emerged. He leaves our story here, therefore, but his influence remains everywhere. Where am I going now? I'm not going to show you the fact that these manuscripts in the Arabic uh, translations and then the subsequent re-translations into modern Persians from the Arabic they created an explosion of material. And uh, from 750 AD until now, hundreds of manuscripts were made all over the Islamic world, many of them traveling back to Persia and even to India and Tibet. And the medieval kings and rulers each wanted their own copy, and they commissioned them lavishly. Robert Irwin told me just uh, before I started that one of the translations, uh, one of the surviving manuscripts of uh, Ibn Makafa says, Ibn Makafa himself says, these, these stories should be illustrated because it'll keep children interested too. So it's not, in, there's many different manuscripts of Ibn Makafa too, but uh, I thought that was quite useful, to, just for me anyway, maybe for you. Scribes, calligraphers, and illustrators labored to produce more, more and more beautiful and competing manuscripts. Let's look at some of these now. So this one is one of my favorite, it's Arabic, and it's, well, I find it quite strange because where are they fighting? They're fighting in the air above a pond of fish. <laughs> How did they do that? You know, I mean, it's a huge jump, Olympic. But uh, somehow it's very beautiful. This is the jackal talking to the lion, Arabic. <laughs> now you're beginning to see the Persian influence where the pictures integrate in a beautiful graphic way with the text, with the calligraphy. Famous story that goes way back to India of the fox and the drum. That's Arabic. The Persian is a little bit more elaborate. Now it's getting nasty. This is the culmination of the first book where the king is driven by his evil vizier, who is one of the jackals, to distrust his best friend, who is the bull, who he's taking out. This is a very unusual manuscript. It's unlike any other manuscript, and it's, it's in pieces. As you can see, the top bit doesn't relate. It's sort of torn out of a man, and it's related. It's supposedly Mongolian. It's a Mongolian version of the story. It's very different in style. I, I mean, I love the jackals kind of. By the way, one of the jackals is a good guy. Uh, Khalil is a good guy. Dimna is the bad guy. Uh, but he wins, you know, evil triumphant in this book, which is why it's Machiavellian. Uh, here's another one from that. The, 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 the donkey that had no ears or heart. And he's unfortunately listening, uh, and he's about to lose his ears and his heart. And you can see who's going to do it in the bottom. But it's a very different tonality than, than, the, uh, than the others. These illustrations... Uh, now live as durable conduits of traditional wisdom. They're, they give us the sort of vital survival of psychology that doesn't require any formal schooling. You just listen to the stories. This is an illustration of the, well, in this case it's two ducks, but originally it's two geese, and the turtle clinging on. They're, they're migrating. They're going to a better pond. They're, they're moving house. So, okay, we'll take you, but don't let go. And this turtle is known for being a little bit talkative, like some lecturers. And, uh, and so he says, okay, of course I can do it. I'll hang on. So he does for a bit, but then he goes over this village, and these people start saying, look at that stupid turtle. I've never seen anything like that. What a, what a stupid idiot. What, what's he doing up there? And the turtle says, shut up. Ah! <laughs> and that's the story. It's a, this is one of the real template stories that's in the Chautauqua tale. None of these show the turtle letting go, but in my book you see the turtle letting go because the illustrator was an animator. So I'm now traipsing down to our own shores, what I consider this unsung masterpiece by Sir Thomas North. And this, remember, this is the abbreviated pedigree of the bit by literature, literature. Not only is it abbreviated, but it's over 120 years old, so if you tried to do one today, uh, you'd probably need the entire wall. 
Sir Thomas North, 1570. This is the first English translation done from the Italian. It is Thomas North who later translates Plutarch's lives into the reference book that Shakespeare used as the source of his knowledge of the Roman world, notably for Julius Caesar and Anthony and Cleopatra. Now this image of the old man teaching the young boy is from his prologue, and sort of looks like the Buddha, doesn't it? You know, it's the same, it's the same idea. He's reading a book, not telling a story. Um, what I particularly like, though, that in 1570, I've highlighted that they got all the languages pretty much spot on, didn't they? They knew in 1570 they came from India and went to Persia and went to Arabia, etc., etc., etc. They got it right. Well, since most people don't know anything about it, I always find it amazing that someone knew it then. But they probably knew much more about it then than we know now. Both North's Plutarch and his version of Bidpai were very popular reading in uh, Renaissance England. There's even an engraving, our old friend the turtle and the birds, straight from the mouth of the Buddha. Now, in England, at the time of Shakespeare. Shakespeare's only a small boy, by the way, so don't get too excited. He's only about eight. So we've completed our five-stage bird's-eye view of the travels of Khalil and Dimna. Quick, fast pace. One of the most popular books in the ancient world. Here's what we've done. Oh, I haven't finished. You're not going to get rid of me that quickly. You're not. I've still got seven more minutes. The oral, the manuscript, and the book transmission. So we've got the Jatapi. You can see it. You can read it for yourself. These animal stories still resonate today as they do two and a half millennia ago. And here's a man telling stories. This is a storyteller in Fez. He's holding, he gets his crowd by going out and strumming the oud very loudly. And he pulls audiences of 60 to 80. Uh, and then he starts telling the story into the, into the microphone while holding his oud. And if people start to wander away, then he bangs the oud again and makes a couple of songs, and then they come back. And he's, he's a master. He is just the master of, of the oral tradition. I asked some local scholars, at, some friends at Fez University, if he ever told any Khalil and Dimna stories. And my friends were very uh, studious about this, they went out and listened to him. I only just said, you know, do you know? And they said, no, and they sent, three of them went out and they listened to him tell stories. For, and uh, eventually they came back and said, well, he does. He does tell stories from Khalil and Dimna, but he doesn't know he's doing that. He's just telling stories. He's just a storyteller, not an educated man. Uh, oh, well, I thought. This is a quote which I like very much from Sir Thomas North which tells you about how this book, I think, survived. It survived because every version of it has got this preciousness associated with it, this wisdom. This is constantly reinforced in every version that you read, you know, that this is an important book. Don't lose this book. Don't waste this book. Preserve it. Take care of it. It's really, really important. These stories. Now, why did all these different cultures take that and do it. And this is obviously a Christianized version of, of that. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I like this, the middle paragraph. This precious gem of knowledge, whoso shall lodge it in the secrecy of his memory, shall never lose it, but shall rather augment and increase it with age in such sort that he shall win a marvelous commodity. Thank you very much.